Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kristen. If for people who are not familiar with me, I am the health and wellness executive with ASA. And today I'm joined by Jonathan, who is a psychologist and director of Athlete Sleep Services with the Center of Sleep and Human Performances in Calgary. Uh, you would be familiar with him if you tuned into our panel at Salt Flats. Uh, he works directly with traditional athletes as well as gamers and esports to help optimize their sleep. He's worked with Red Bull, he's involved in experimental research, and one of his goals is to create a reliable and valid screening tool to help gamers identify sleep issues and help find solutions that will directly impact training and performance. So today we have the honor of having Jonathan join us again for a formal presentation on sleep as a cornerstone of good performance in esports. So we'll also be answering questions at the end of this presentation. So anyone in the chat is free to kind of put in their questions in the chat and I'll be keeping track of them as we go. So thank you again guys for attending and I'll let Jonathan take it over from here. All right, thank you for the presentation, Kristen. Uh, and so I, with no further ado, so I'll present uh, the esports e-athlete and sleep and their link to uh, performance. So as uh, Christian mentioned, I am the director of the Athlete Sleep Services and behavioral simulation specialist at the Center for Sleep and Human Performance. Uh, where I work at the Center for Sleep, we own the copyrights for the Athlete Sleep Screening Questionnaire, which is the tool that we are trying to develop among the e-athletes. And I'm also a PhD in psychology and a uh, member of the Canadian Sleep Society, and I'm taking care of the media and the advocacy. So to begin with, I'd like to have a brief overview of the uh, basic science and uh, sleep and, rhythm, and circadian rhythm. So the uh, biology behind sleep. So basically, we have two systems that governs our brain, which is the wake and the sleep system. So while we're awake, our brain will fire and use some uh, neurotransmitter to actually enhance our energy and keep us awake and alert throughout the day. And as we move along the day and we go towards the evening, our brain will have a slight shift towards the evening nest uh, system, which is a sleep system, and will use the other uh, neurotransmitter from the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus to actually oversee and govern the uh, sleep factor. These are controlled, as I said, by the uh, SCN, so the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and you have two influence, major influence on your uh, sleep system that is governed by the master clock. You have first the homeostatic influence, which is, in other words, the sleep pressure that you will accumulate throughout your day. So the longer you are awake, the more sleepy you will tend to be towards the end of the day. And the other one is circadian influence. So throughout the day, you will have influence and we will stay with the light influence of when should you take a nap and why are you feeling more sleepy in the beginning of the afternoon? When should you sleep in the evening and when you should avoid sleeping in the evening, even if you have sleep pressure accumulated throughout the day. So basically, throughout your day, you will have a sleep load that will accumulate. So from we have the example here from 9 a.m. till approximately 11 p.m. where your sleep load is at its strongest. So most, and we will take the example of a traditional sleeper of 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Goes to sleep towards 11 and his sleep load would dissipate throughout the, uh, the night to be at a minimal when he wakes up. And then you have the circadian inference. So as you wake up, your circadian, your alertness system will be uh, gaining a uh, track and will be uh, increasing throughout your day. And in the middle of the afternoon, this is when you feel a little uh, deep in your energy. And this is when you should be napping. It's not because of the too big of a lunch, as a lot of people say, it's because biologically, the human being are meant to have a short nap in the beginning of the afternoon or middle of the afternoon to recover and take on the second part of the day. And these uh, circadian rhythm, this circadian rhythm is uh, linked to the presence and the absence of light. So as you can see, it's controlled by the pineal gland that is next to the uh, uh, to your master clock. And throughout the day, you will have the light signal going through your retina and then will be transferred as an information to your brain 
to say, well, it's time to be awake, it's time to be alert, it's time to have energy, and so on and so forth. And the absence of light will create another uh, signal, which is what we're going towards the end of the day. We're going towards a trend where we should lower our neurotransmitter, where we should lower our activity, and where we should prepare the stage of sleep. And your brain is very good at doing this uh, game with the presence and the absence of light. So that's why it's super important to know that light has an important impact on your sleep and your brain. And the absence of light will help your brain create the melatonin secretion. So it needs to be understand that the melatonin is not the hormone of sleep, it's the hormone of darkness. So if you stay uh, exposed to too much light during the evening, you will impact the secretion of your melatonin, most probably delay it, and you will impair your night. So if by playing at the play of having light and absence of light, you will then help your brain enhance the uh, melatonin secretion, which will provide you with a better uh, evening and a better night and a better quality of sleep. So that's it for the, uh, the uh, basic uh, biology behind sleep. So a sleep overview now. I mean, as we know, sleep is a problem that is prevalent among the athletes because of the nature of the sport being behind a screen. Uh, poor sleep is a risk factor for poor mental health in e-athletes, not only in e-athletes, but also in all traditional athletes. And poor sleep impairs e-athletes' uh, performance. If you have an e-athlete that is not sleeping well, it's not recovered, his or her performance will be decreased for sure on the following weeks, following months, following years, if you accumulate a sleep debt. Uh, however, we know that sleep extension may improve your, um, your performance. And We'll talk more about this a little bit later. One of the challenges is screening for sleep problem in e-athletes. How do we get e-athletes to be screened for their sleep issue? How do we screen them? When do we screen them? Who should screen them? And following the screening and uh, the screening of the sleep problem in e-athletes, how do we have the intervention? What kind of intervention does the e-athletes need? Does he need an intervention to begin with? Who should do the intervention with the athletes? As you know, sleep will change with uh, with age. So as you can see here, and this is not for a long time now, back in the mid nineties, at the beginning of uh, your your life, so five years old till one hundred years old for those who reach it, your sleep efficiency will be as it highest and will slowly decrease as you get older. And the insufficient sleep, however, is uh, is a recover. It's not recover. It's known to be more prevalent among the 18 to 35 years old. And if you look at this, it's supposed to be one of the part of your life where your sleep efficiency should be at the top of uh, its potential. So why is the complaint of insufficient sleep is more prevalent among the group age? of which your sleep efficiency should be higher. And also it should be noted that between 18 and 35, it's a range where e-athletes will be at their top of their game, pretty much like every athlete. But yet again, this is the, the, the group age that complains the most about their uh, sleep. Another factor with e-athletes that we don't see a lot with uh, traditional athletes is that e-athletes may resemble shift workers. A casual gamer may play on average 24 hours weekly. What is considered an e-athlete may roughly play 60 hours weekly, which is approximately 10 hours a day. And you have different, uh, and you know, you have different scenario uh, for the e-athletes, the face-to-face -face scenario, for example, the battlefield and the strategy-based game. And this will require the team of e-athletes to adopt a rotating shift work schedule. So for example, if you take a team that is based out of North America and they are playing in a tournament against a team that is based out of Asia. And now because of COVID, we cannot travel. So they will separate their team in two and they will usually uh, use the two uh, range hour of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. or 3 p.m. to midnight. And this will have an impact on your sleep depth. This will have an impact on your accumulation of sleep pressure, and this will have definitely an impact on your circadian rhythm. So 
those who finish uh, playing around uh, midnight may have more difficulty falling asleep than those who finish at, uh, at five. And on the other end, those who, fin those who will need to start playing at eight, well, are they able to go to bed earlier than midnight? And now we have a, uh, an issue of the athletes that are young are not able to go to bed before midnight, but they need and they are required to play at 8 a.m. in the morning. So there is strategy for that that have been used for years and years now with shift working uh, individual. And it's, it is believed that it should be a similar intervention with the athletes when they are faced with these kind of tournament. Also, esports is probably the, one of the sports that will offer the most inclusive environment among any sports, meaning that anyone can actually play e-games, e-sports, no matter if you're Caucasian, Asian, Black, any disparities, you can be included in, in, in sport. And if you take the, uh, the easy example of hockey in North America, it's more of a Caucasian sport and the sleep disparity in health would be less of an issue. But in eSports, it's probably one of the most inclusive sports you'll see. So it's important to know that there are a disparity in sleep health. So for example, Black and African American, on average, you sleep 48 fewer minutes per night. They have more than the double of the chance of having difficulty with their awakening at night. So they have a tendency to wake up more frequently at night. They also have 3.2 more chance to have difficulty with early awakenings in the morning, and also the double of the chance to uh, experience daytime sleepiness. The Hispanic and Latino uh, population is a pretty similar. They have almost they have 2.9 more chance to experience sleep hallucination, 2.7 more chance to experience sleep paralysis, and 2.2 more chance for experiencing nightmare that may disturb their next day. American Indian and Alaskan Native, on average, they may sleep almost one hour less per night, which is seven hours per week. This is not futile. And you have the Asian Pacific Islander uh, population. There are, as you can see, 4.7 more likely to be a loud snorer. 3.6 more likely to experience sleep paralysis and 5.1 more likely to experience daytime sleepiness. And if you just think about this, if you feel, if you are sleepy and you're trying to either attend school because most of the athletes are also students, you may have difficulty to stay alert in your class. And then you may also have difficulty staying alert when you play your game and then it will bring you down the path of you need coffee, you need energy drink, and you will try to cope with any external mechanism that you can reach out to actually stay away without addressing your sleep. So this is a disparity we can see in sleep health. What is sleep disturbance? This is a new paper that has been uh, developed by Walsh and their team uh, very recently, as you can see in 2021. So at the core center, you see that there are sleep disturbance. What is a sleep disturbance? Well, it can be linked to an early morning training. So if I take the example of a traditional sport, triathletes, I mean, they need to swim, they need to cycle, they need to run. Most of them, they will be required to be in the water very early in the morning. So their sleep disturbance may be linked to the early morning training. Then you have the unfamiliar sleeping environment. So when you are in a tournament or in an international competition, you may not sleep in your own bed. You may be sleeping in a hotel room. You may be in a hotel room that is next to the elevator and throughout the night, you will have the very annoying sign of the elevator that will keep you awake or you're next to the ice machine. Uh, to the ice machine. And we have those who are just not liking sleeping in, in an unfamiliar uh, environment, such as a hotel, and they sleep just poorly in hotels. You have the high training loads. So those who train high in multiple and multiple hours per week, they may feel more sore, they may have a different uh, arousal index because their body is overtrained. This may also create some sleep disturbance. 
you have the night competition. Those who will be required to uh, compete uh, later than 9 and 10 and 11 p.m. And we know that in uh, esports, that is a tendency of a lot of uh, gamer and e athletes gaming ex uh, excessively late. So their bedtime is later, their wake time is also later, but can they sleep in? Some can, some cannot. You have also the traveling whenever we will be uh, allowed to travel again. So those uh, e-athletes coming from North America, going for a tournament in Europe, going for a tournament in Australia, going for a tournament in Asia or vice versa, these uh, long travel will uh, be anywhere with a uh, jet lag. How do you recuperate? How do you recover from a jet lag? Should you adapt before and for a jet lag? Is the stress of having a long flight impairing your night before leaving? So as you can see, sleep disturbance is a multi-factor aspect. And on the non-score factor, you have also multiple, uh, multiple factors that could impact your sleep. So the attitude and belief uh, towards sleep, what are the societal inference and the individual expectation? What, do you, what is the athlete expecting out of his or her sleep? Do you expect sleeping eight hours per night every single night uh, before midnight? Uh, do you expect sleeping eight hours from 3 uh, a.m. to 12 uh, to till noon? I mean, what are your expectations? What do you think is best for you may not align with what sleep should be? The work and study commitment. Again, it goes with those athletes who may be uh, sponsored uh, by high uh, by a big company and they have requirement for interview they have requirement for uh, commercial they have a requirement for uh, signatures and this may all be later training then delay their sleep and this may also have trickled down to have an impact on the, uh, on the difficulty of sleeping then the social demands yes you are uh, e athletes but you are also a friend you are also a student you may also be a worker and then you have the social media that oh, let's let's face it takes time out of everyone's schedule so now with all of this so you're an e-athlete that may train and compete for roughly 60 hours a week on top of that you're an, you're a student that will require to attend class to study to prepare for exam and then on top of that, you have your social life. You, you want to meet with your friend and you, you have your family. So depending on the, uh, <clears throat> the social demands of your life, it may also impact your sleep. And this goes with a family uh, commitment. Do you have children? Do you have a spouse? Uh, how do you manage this time, uh, your time of training, family, friends, student life? So you don't always cut your sleep short so you can have more time for all these non-sport factors, all these sports factors. I mean, the first thing you cut out most of the time to study is sleep. First thing you cut out most of the time to train a little bit, an extra 30 minutes is sleep. And this will trickle down to the non-sport factor impact on sleep. And also the individual characteristic, as we said, as you are aging, you may have more sleep difficulty. Gender has also a, a, an influence on your sleep. I mean, it's it's been long known that a female have more difficulty with sleeping. They are more likely to experience insomnia throughout their life. And the last one, the lifestyle choice, is your diet, your food intake, when and what you eat will have an impact on your sleep. Coffee, for example, is the most prevalent one. If you sleep poorly and you drink an extra cup of coffee to keep you awake, you will impact your sleep the next night. Sleeping even more poorly, therefore probably increasing your, your, your caffeine intake or maybe your energy during intake. And now you're stuck in a vicious circle of I'm sleeping poorly, I don't know how to take care of my sleep. So in order to stay awake and alert during the day because I need it at school and, and, and for my sport, I'm surfing on coffee. I'm surfing on uh, energy red, red Bull Monster. And that's what I said by being stuck in the vicious circle of lifestyle choice sometimes. Another uh, crucial factor among uh, athletes is the mental health. 
I mean, aside sleep, there's a uh, couple of factors that are present, highly prevalent among uh, athletes and the athletes. For example, almost 20% of athletes will report a high level of distress throughout their uh, teenage years and a young adulthood. Adult, adulthood. Uh, almost 27% will report sleep disturbance of any kind. So is it uh, difficulty falling asleep? Is it difficulty staying asleep? Is it uh, experiencing uh, uh, hangover uh, morning, morning hangover? Is it feeling unrefreshed? Is it feeling overly sleepy during the day? I mean, there's a lot of sleep disturbance. It's not only insomnia. There is more to the story to it. Almost 33%, 34% in fact, report significant anxiety or depression. And we know that uh, poor sleep, depression, and anxiety is closely linked. I mean, the more depressed you feel, the more likely you are to have poor sleep, or the more anxious you feel, the more likely you are you have to be feel, to have experience in poor sleep. And the other way around is also true. The, the poorer you're sleeping, the more likely you are to develop or experience in, uh, anxiety or depression. They are close leading one of uh, these two together. And 57% of those athletes in the uh, Good Barge uh, study were reporting in at least one incident of anxiety and depression per year. And lastly, almost 20%, so one out of five athletes may report alcohol abuse, either to help them sleep or just to cope with the mental distress. And here uh, in uh, other uh, similar uh, study conducted by Ramsey, you can see the uh, likelihood of feeling hopelessness, overwhelm, exhausted, loneliness, sadness, functional problem, anxiety, anger, because yes, the less you sleep, maybe the shorter your fuse, maybe, desire to hurt yourself, suicide ideation and suicide attempts. These are all important uh, variables that are should not be taken lightly. And this is all linked to sleep. The poorer you're sleeping, the more likely you are to experience one of these variables. And most of the time, the problem is that the person or the individual or the athletes or the e-athletes that is experiencing one of these mental health distress will not make the link towards the sleep. I'm not saying that sleep by it itself will create or prevent you from experiencing one of these factors. But I can promise you that if your sleep is well adapted and well managed, you will be less likely to experience one of these mental health distress. And as I said, a lot of the athletes usually are younger, so teenage, early adulthood. So most of them will be still a uh, student. So the academic performance is very important. I know as an ex-athlete, whenever my academic performance were uh, not as high as expected, it had an impact on my sleep. Therefore, it had an impact on my sports. The athletes are no different. 18% uh, of those who report sleep difficulties were affecting their academic performance. As you can see here, those who have a D grade average they were not li most likely to have difficulty falling asleep or having early morning awakening or daytime tiredness or inability to stay asleep. Those who were more, more likely to experience all of these except the inability to stay awake was those who were close to failing or those who were failing. <clears throat> and the most prevalent one was the difficulty falling asleep. So just imagine you're very close to failing your class or your year or you are actually failing whenever you're going to hit the bed. Of course, you're going to think about this, or oh, do I, will I need to take my class back next year? And so on and so forth. What would be the uh, downstream uh, effect on my uh, journey throughout uh, the uh, academic uh, world? And as you're thinking about this, you're not thinking about your sport and you're not thinking about your recovery. And finally, you fall asleep. You may have early morning awakenings. Then you'll be tired during the day you may have uh, more coffee again to stay awake and of course your day and your uh, performance uh, beyond your sport will be inevitably affected 
And the same thing goes for uh, the initial insomnia. Those who are more likely to have uh, initial insomnia, tiredness, sleepiness, uh, they were all uh, around the D average. So this is very important to understand. It's not that you have a poor grade that will impact your sleep, it's the other way around. Those who have poor sleep will have poorer grade, therefore will have more impact on their sleep. Uh, under uh, under uh, sports, now it's important to connect. As I said, I'm hammering that nail since the beginning. Sleep and performance together. Those who have insufficient sleep duration or poor sleep quality, fatigue and sleepiness, suboptimal sleep timing, so the circadian factor. Should you be in bed before midnight? Should you not? Uh, irregular sleep schedule. Those who go to bed at midnight and then at 10 and then at 1 a.m. and then back to 10, they're in fact, in, they're in fact inflicting to themselves what we call a social jet lag. And the sleep in circadian disorder. They're all tightly linked to these outcomes, which is a decrease in muscular strength and speed, an increase in the rate and the likelihood of having a, an injury or a concussion. You're, decre you're increasing also your reaction time and vigilance, which is highly, highly important for any athletes. This is a decision making and creativity, again, highly important for the athletes. I mean, you've got to be uh, creative whenever you're on a, a battlefield game or a face to face game. You've got to be the most creative to beat your opponent. Learning and memory, again, if you're learning a new map, you need to be well recovered. And the mental health, yes, poor sleep, as we just saw, will have an impact on your mental health. Sleep and extension and other strategy. So these are the two strategies that we see the most often uh, during with athletes and the athletes. So let's start with coffee. I'm not saying coffee is the worst enemy of sleep. If it's used on a strategic approach, individualized approach, it can be good because coffee is an ergogenic enhancer. It needs to be understood that there is a half-life also uh, linked with coffee. So the example we always give is if you take your coffee around noon, then six hours later, you will still have 50% of the caffeine going on in your system. Then add another six hours, so towards midnight, you will still have around 25% the coffee in your system. This is a general rule, so it's not everyone that will react that way, but those who are very sensitive to coffee may have an impact on their sleep even if they're stopping around you. However, for example, uh, with traditional athletes, uh, those who have two games and two nights, so two games within 48 hours, or coffee could be a good strategy, especially if they need to travel in between these two games. So coffee will be a very good strategy for the second game, not the first game, because we want to protect their sleep as much as possible in between their, their, their two games. And then on the next game, you want to drive them on coffee because you know that the next day will be a off day for them. So coffee will have an impact on your sleep. And there's a new approach with gums. So you can chew your caffeine gums. And based uh, on a study, you should be able to eliminate the, ca the caffeine a little bit more faster. But again, it's, it is a very individualized approach when it comes to coffee. It more of uh, get your sleep in order and coffee should be used strategically only when needed, not automatically. A uh, same ring of bell. I mean, there's several e-athletes that are sponsored by energy drinks, so they will promote them. And of course, we have absolutely no problem with them. Sponsor are part of uh, uh, e-athletes and athletes life and uh, gladly, so I mean, this, this is a way of earning a living. However, those who are drinking more than two uh, drink, uh, energy drink per day were associated with a mental health uh, difficulty, more likely to be uh, linked to aggressive behavior and fatigue. Why fatigue? Just as I said, the uh, the vicious path of I'm sleeping poorly, therefore I'm going to drink energy drink or coffee to stay on the top of my game. Then I'm going to sleep poorly again, and as poorly as you sleep, now you may become more likely to be anger, angry, or as I said, short fused, and you're snapping. 
and we see, I mean, you all saw it, you all seen it, the video on a uh, e-gamer snapping at, at its game or at, its, uh, at his performance. It, it's not the kind of behavior that you're looking for. So it goes with the same approach as coffee. Get your sleep in order. Whenever you need an extra apport of energy, we may look into a strategic approach of coffee or, or energy drink. But again, energy drink, there is a study out there that are claiming that even if your sleep is in order and you're consuming an energy drink, there is minimal impact on your performance. It's not linked to enhancing your performance. But the research is still on this, so I would argue that you should maybe looking more into coffee if needed. An energy drink, well, we'll need more data on it to be actually convinced that it has no impact on your performance. But the best performance and answer is increasing your sleep. I mean, there is this uh, study back in 2011 from with a basketball, a university basketball team, all they did was increasing your time in bed. And it did improve all the variable for basketball players. So, they improve their reaction time, they improve their uh, sprinting uh, time, they improve their free throw percentage, they improve their three point percentage. So I do not see why it would not have the same impact on an e-athlete. If it works with traditional sports such as basketball at a university age, I would not see or believe that it would not have that kind of impact, positive impact for e-athletes. And this is simply increasing or adapting and well managing your sleep. So what should we do? Again, you, there's a culture behind this. And as you can see, you can sleep when you're dead or they will be sleeping enough in the grave and no one looks back on their life and remembers the nights they had plenty of sleep. I mean, the culture behind not sleeping is brutal for years and years. So there is an importance of screening because on the other end of the spectrum, it's not true that 50% of athletes or e-athletes are suffering from sleep difficulty or insomnia. That is a myth. That is why screening properly and adequately is important to actually identify those who need an intervention from those who doesn't. And, and also identify those who may benefit from sleep education just to fine tune their approach with sleep. So it goes a lot through the education as I said and culture. Why culture? Here in North America, for example, you should sleep an hour and you should be in bed before midnight and uh, the early birds get the worms and you have that other culture of going in bed early and waking up early. If you just travel down south in uh, Argentina, you may not have the same uh, approach. They have a way later bedtime. They have a way later rise time. Should it be an hour? Again, that's where I'm saying the culture is important to be understood. So what is your approach and your belief towards sleep will be fundamental in how you will actually optimize it. The tracking and the optimization will also be part of e-athletes. Uh, I mean, a lot uh, of athletes have their Fitbits or their Oura Ring or their Wood Bank. At the end of the day, is tracking really optimizing your sleep? I mean, if you know that you've been sleeping an hour, but you have spent 50% of your night in stage two and 20% in stage three and five and I mean, at the end of the day, it does this information helps you get a better sleep. At the end of the day, that's what you want. Athletes and e-athletes, they don't want to sleep eight hours. They want to feel refreshed in the morning. They want to they want to enhance their performance. They want to enhance their quality of life, not sleeping eight hours. So fundamentally, does tracking your sleep will help you optimize your performance. And based on all of this, so the screening, then the education, the culture you're dealing with, the tracking, and what are the goals of the e-athletes and athletes, you will develop an individualized uh, intervention. What does the e-athletes want out of this? And then you have a discussion with him or with her, and you develop that intervention for sleep. So 
training for sleep, it's a problem in the athletes. And not only in the athletes, in the athletes in general. Why? Because everyone is an outlier. As I said, are you dealing with a e athlete that is a night owl? Are you dealing with an e athlete that is an early bird? Meaning that the early bird should be in bed around 9, 10 and be away by 6 a.m. However, the night owl cannot be in bed at 10 even if he wishes for it. I mean, he's not going to feel sleepy before midnight or 1. So everyone is different. The validity of the measure and risk factor. What are you using to actually measure or screen for your sleep? Is that a validated measure for e-athletes or athletes? I'm taking again the example of the wearables that is on just below. The wearables that you will use are reliable for a behavior X, which means that they will always give you the same answer for behavior X. Is that behavior related or validated in sleep? The answer is no. So one of the challenge I give my e-athletes or athletes that are um, having a discussion with me on this is wear one on your wrist and wear one on your ankle. And the next day, just compare your data. They're, they are tracking the same individual just from the ankle and from the, the wrist and you will see two completely different sleepers. Never forget this, that absence of movement does not necessarily equal sleep. You can be watching TV and you're not necessarily sleeping. However, your device may be tracking this as sleep. And as you're sleeping, you may also be moving. Doesn't mean that you are awake, but your uh, device may track this as an arousal. And you may also want to uh, account for the structural challenge. As I said earlier, I took the uh, triathletes as an example. So yes, no one should be awake at five to be training. However, the goal of a sleep specialist is not to change the nature of the sport. You want to try to work with as much flexibility as you can. So what type of athlete do you have in front of you? Do you have a night owl? Do you have an early bird? What type of sport is he playing? And then with these structural challenge, you try to optimize their sleep. You try to optimize their performance. You try to optimize their quality of life. And hopefully at the end of the day, when you're done with them, they will be able to understand sleep in such a good fashion that they will be able to bank their sleep in a weekly manner and they will not focus on a nightly so the wearable in e athlete. so it's a measurement versus an intervention. So as I said, if your uh, watch is telling you that you're sleeping an hour with the distribution across your sleep stage with 47 uh, arousal uh, throughout your night, this does not constitute an intervention. This only constitutes a measurement. Again, a measurement that is not validated in sleep. So at the end of the day, is that information helping the e athletes to enhance their performance, to enhance their sleep. So that's the problem with the validity. There's none. It's coming soon though. I'm, I'm very harsh right now on the wearables, but with the, the monstrous amount of data that they are gathering, five to 10 years from now, they will be most probably a golden standard. They're very close to become a golden standard, but they're just not there yet. So it's important to understand that. And there's a problem with data security. As I said, they're gathering an enormous amount of data. We don't know what they're doing there. I mean, they know when you're moving, they know when you're not moving, they know when you are walking, they know when you're running, they know when you're outside of your house, they know approximately everything about your behavior. So here's the problem with the data security. They are gathering so much information on you and they don't necessarily disclose what they're doing with it. They're most probably developing algorithms. But from there, we have no idea. And the answer is we don't know what they're doing with this. So it, it's the uh, thin line of are you comfortable with this or not? And you have the screening questionnaire. So as uh, Christian mentioned in the beginning of the uh, presentation, we are actually working on developing a screening questionnaire for sleep that would be validated for e-athletes. 
the goal of that questionnaire is to identify the athletes that need a referral to a sleep physician, that need a referral for a behavioral management, or that need only a referral for education and those who are just sleeping well. So here's what it looks like. I know it looks, uh, it's overwhelming, but we'll go one step at a time. So you always start with sleep education and then you have your group of e athletes. You use the uh, screening tool, the sleep screening tool. So at the far left, you have someone with no sleep problem. Send them back and what he needs is only sleep education. In the middle, you have the one with mild sleep problem. So after that, you identify the sleep uh, difficulties that will require improvement and you manage them behaviorally. So is it a, a, at the beginning of the night you have difficulty falling asleep? Is it in the middle of the night that you have difficulty maintaining your sleep? Is it at the end of the night you have difficulty uh, with your early morning awakening? And then with all these information, and we can strategize an intervention behaviorally so we can enhance your sleep. And you can monitor them uh, long-term with a sleep log and a sleep monitor device again. If you know what to do with the information uh, that the, the wearable are giving you back and you're trusting your uh, e athletes to uh, use them adequately, sure, you can use that. And once uh, everything is uh, in order and the athletes is, is uh, satisfied, you send them back to step one, which is only sleep uh, education. And you have the other category, those who are moderate to severe sleep uh, problem. They need to be referred to a sleep specialist. Uh, then there is the consultation and testing that is <clears throat> the problem. And the problem goes with the diagnosis, which is a, it can be a multiple uh, different problem. It could go from a, from insomnia to a sleep disorder breathing, which is more uh, commonly known as uh, obstructive sleep apnea. You may have a difficulty with your circadian rhythm. So we have these athletes that have a delayed circadian rhythm, those who are not able to fall or initiate sleep before 3 a.m. in the morning. Yes, they do exist. Don't use that as an excuse as though. It's a very uh, small part of the population. You have the movement disorder, those who are uh, feeling an urge to move their legs, and you have the uh, narcolepsy, parasomnia. Then once the diagnosis is done with the sleep physician, you treat the athletes up to standard when he is or she is satisfied and you send them back to sleep education and you may rescreen them to be sure that your intervention is holding the challenge of time. So sleep in education and changing the culture. First thing first, we need to make the information accessible and useful, such as we're doing right now. I mean, a lot of athletes and the athletes and the individual don't even know that sleep specialists exist. They have a sleeping problem and they come to the conclusion, well, that's how I am. And my mom or my dad were a poor sleeper. So therefore I'm a poor sleeper. And that's just, uh, I just picked the wrong card in the deck when I was born. Well, that's not the, that's not the end of, of the game. I mean, no, if you have a sleep problem, there are specialists and the information will be accessible to you. And that's on us, the stages, to make this information accessible. And as you can see, there is more and more sleep presentation. Uh, providing information about sleep to help individuals make better choice. As I said, <clears throat> it's not about making an individual sleeping eight hours. It's about educating them about what sleep is, what sleep is for, what are your goals, what do you want out of sleep? And once the individual do understand what sleep is, it will help him or her make better choice to enhance his or her quality of life. That's what is important at the end of the day is we want your quality of life and your performance to be enhanced, not necessarily sleeping eight hours a night. Uh, providing information about sleep problem and how to get help. So if you have insomnia uh, or if you have sleep apnea, these are two sleep problems that have uh, different information and different challenge and needs different specialists. So providing information about what insomnia is, what a sleeping uh, breathing disorder is, is fundamental because after that, the referral will be different and the assessment will be different, the screening will be different. 
So having all this information, knowing that there is more than one sleep uh, difficulty or problem, that sleep difficulty is not only insomnia, is important for every individual so they can get the proper help they need. Uh, providing a strategy for troubleshooting with sleep problem. So at the end of the day, once I am done with athletes or e-athletes, I tell him, them <clears throat> from the get-go that sleeping seven good nights out of seven per week, it's wishful thinking. Really. If you're sleeping five to six good nights per week, you're a very good sleeper. The idea with the one poor night is being able to develop strategy to keep that one suboptimal night at one suboptimal night. That you know exactly what to do after one four night of sleep to resume a good pattern of sleep. So now, because of the education that the athletes and the e athletes went through with us, they know exactly what to do. They know, okay, so I had a poor night because I, I don't know, I, I drank a coffee too late or uh, I had a night out with my friends and so on and so forth. So that's not a big problem. It's you are able to identify what, what was the cause of your poor sleep and the next night you're able to be back on track. And it's important to consider the importance of sleep for recovery and performance, meaning that sleep is not just being unconscious on your mattress and then you wake up and your life resumes. While you're sleeping, there is a whole mechanism of recovery that is happening in your brain. It is a very, very dynamic state in which you are unconscious, which is the pillar of your recovery and therefore the one of the pillar of your performance the next day. So if you want to take a very cliche approach, your night of sleep is only your investment in your next day energy. So take it seriously. I can sleep. Is it worth it? As I mentioned earlier, what do you want to do with the information of your wristband on your Fitbit or Apple Watch or app that you have on your phone? What do you need it for? Does it help you or does it, on the, on the opposite, trigger some anxiety? Well, it's been a week, I'm not sleeping well because when you look at my watch, it's saying that I'm sleeping only 60% of what I should be sleeping and so on and so forth. And now you're just catastrophizing. So does it work it? There's different kind of uh, device and technology on there. So they're not all created equal. So the Fit, you have the Fitbit, the ActiWatch, you have the Apple Watch, you have the Garmin Watch, you have the Ura Ring, you have the uh, Dream Band. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on with that. They don't have all the same reliability and validity, but I can promise you that none of them have the validity of uh, screening for sleep properly and adequately as does a polysomnography in a sleep lab. So at the end of the day, be careful with what kind of device you're buying, what are their validity, what are their reliability, and again, what do you want to do with the information you're getting out of them? As I mentioned, validated device providing unvalidated metrics, their, their device are good, they're good at selling you that they are a sleep metric validated device. But in fact, what they are is a movement tracker. They're tracking your movement. They're tracking the frequency of movement, the absence of movement, the amplitude of your movement. But again, absence of movement is not presence of sleep. And presence of movement is not absence of sleep. So they have, with the tons and tons of data they have gathered throughout the years, they are able to say, well, this person is most likely sleeping eight times out of 10. So we're just tracking that into sleep. So that's why I'm saying be careful with the tracking uh, devices. Uh, lack of guidance regarding what to do with sleep. And as I said, uh, if you're sleeping 20% uh, of your night in uh, stage three, what does that mean to you? Does that improve your knowledge? Does that improve your... Uh, optimization for your next day, that's, that will improve uh, your performance? The answer is most likely not. So what do you do with the information? Is an arousal the same thing as an arousal index? No, it, it's not. But again, what do you do with the information? Does, does that help you? And the 
private team can condition IT content, as I said, they are gathering data and data and data, and we have no clue what kind of privacy they're using, meaning that we don't know the confidentiality uh, that they are dealing with and what are they doing with your information. So that's a downside of the, uh, of the tracking sleep systems. Following that, you have a question for the esports organization. What should we do about sleep tracking and technology? Do we want the organization to not pressure, but support these uh, company of sleep tracking devices for their population? Do we want the esports organization to support them so that their athletes, their e-athletes will be more likely to buy them and track their sleeping, their sleep? It's a question that it's worth saying for the uh, this very new emerging uh, sport. What are the limits? How do we evaluate device? Which device do we pick? If we decide, if the organization decide to go down that path, which device should be should they be uh, backing up? Should they be uh, supporting? In which manner? And what are the limits of a support to a, 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 a technology company? How can we get the athletes to sleep better without changing their training schedule too much? That is probably one of the most important thing with athletes. At the end of the day, sleep is not gonna re uh, rationalize the entire sport world. What I mean by that, it's a very slow movement forward before we end the early morning uh, training before we end the too late of a night gaming. I mean, there is one, uh, <clears throat> there's one study out there with the NBA that just track their, the NBA athletes through Twitter. And those athletes who were tweeting between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., they were gathering that information and they look at their performance the next day, they were decreased by 2%. You may argue that 2% is not much, but as you know, in professional sport, and the same goes for professional esport, two percent will make the difference between you losing and you winning. So by that, what I mean is, what can be manageable and changeable in the frame schedule? To what extent are you willing to make those change in order to optimize your sleep? Not where well, you what you need to do with sleep. You need to be in bed between 10 and 11, and you absolutely need to be up between 7 and 8. And the athlete may come back and say, well, I can because I have school, or I can because my training sessions start at 8 or even at 7. So now there's the negotiation part. Uh, okay, so where do we find ourselves in terms of flexibility for both the sleeping schedule and the training schedule? So you don't want to overpower the training schedule with sleep, and vice versa. You want to be as flexible as possible, so you optimize. Again, you do want to optimize the performance. You don't want to cure anything. I can we leverage screening, education, and tracking to minimize injury risk? <clears throat> so basically, a recover athlete is an athlete that is less likely to be injured. That's the bottom line here. So with that, the less injury you may sustain throughout your career, the longer your career will be and the more successful your career should be also. So only with that approach should you be able to make, um, uh, make the athlete understand that the education, the screening and the tracking is important for their own good, for their performance, either in their sport or academic. And the screening should not take more than 15, 20 minutes. The education, pretty much attending one uh, sleep presentation such as this one. And the tracking, only if needed, quite uh, honestly. I'm not going to strap a uh, Fitbit or Apple Watch on anyone if they don't want to. I mean, we can use a sleep log. So all of these information will be gathered in order to minimize the, injury, the risk injury, in order to optimize the sleep performance and the uh, sports performance. So that's how you leverage. It's not you need to be screened every month and you need to attend a, an education session every month. It's you try to make this as light as possible, as realistic as possible. Again, you don't you don't want to uh, change too much because if you're changing too much, the athlete is just not going to buy into it, and the, the organization is not going to buy into it either. 
when should we mitigate and how? You should mitigate only when you are screened by a sleep physician. How? How the sleep physician see fits with you. It's not self-medicating. Do not use over-the-counter uh, pills for sleep. If you are that far down the path of going to the drugstore and buying sleepies, maybe you need an appointment with a sleep physician. If you need a medication, it will be decided uh, during the uh, appointment between you and the sleep physician. How? It will be done in a, in a fashion, in a timely fashion on which medication should be suited for you, how much and for how long. The idea is not to give the athletes a prescription and see you in a year and we're just going to renew it. <clears throat> the physician has their uh, appointment and their screening tools. This athletes may need medication, what type of medication, what uh, dose of medication, and as soon as possible, they will uh, withdraw the medication from the e-athletes when the e-athletes is back to normal. That's the idea here. So the bottom line here is do not self-medicate. If you are as far down as going to buy sleepies at, at the drugstore, maybe that's a red, yellow flag for you that you may need a, an appointment with a physician. How do we know whether supplements and substance are impacting sleep? Well, that's how do we know that? So substance, yes, if you need alcohol to sleep, it is impacting your sleep. If you need coffee to stay away during your day, yes, it is impacting your sleep. Supplements, at the end of the day, supplements, it's depending from which country you're from, it will be a different, uh, different tone. I know that in Australia, I believe you need a prescription to actually put your hand on melatonin. Here, you can buy them 10 milligrams of pill if you want. But melatonin should again be used only under the recommendation of a sleep specialist or a sleep physician. So everything that you may consume for sleep, just take for granted that it has an impact on sleep, but not necessarily positively. So if you, as I said, if you are as far down as trying to self-medicate even though it's with natural uh, medication, uh, natural uh, components such as melatonin or magnesium and so on and so forth just take the 30 45 minute appointment with a sleep specialist just to make sure that you actually need that and that there is not a behavioral problem that is actually increasing the other ratio of you having poor sleep and when should we travel and when should we sleep so this is for when COVID will be finally over, when we will be able to resume our traveling. So sh when should we travel? What is the flexibility of the organization and the athletes who are traveling? So can they afford traveling a week in advance to their competition? And if the answer is no, can we go for five days, four days, three days, two days? What is the flexibility there? <clears throat> and based out of that, then you can create a traveling schedule based with when do you eat, when do we sleep. I mean, at the end of the day, the, uh, the company airline do not care if you're traveling for a tournament. If you're in a daytime uh, zone, it will be clear as they uh, in the airplane. However, if at your arrival destination, it's night, we want you to replicate as much as possible the destination. So we will have a strategy for you to replicate as much as possible the nighttime in your airplane, even though it's daytime. So all of these uh, little strategy, again, with the presence and absence of light, will be individualized with an athlete that is traveling. It will be it will be uh, lined out when he should attempt to nap, when he should attempt to sleep, when he should attempt to stay awake at all costs, when he should eat, when he should avoid to eat, in order to make the travel as impactless as possible for the competition. So what's next? What's next is a better understanding connection between sleep and physical and mental performance. Sleep, physical, and mental performance all are all intertwined. The better you sleep, the better your physical and mental performance will be. The poorer you sleep, the more likely you are to be injured. Physical and performance have decreased. When an athlete is injured, most likely they're not at their best mentally. 
So again, mentally performance may decrease, then it may have an impact on academics. And now again, you're stuck in a vicious circle. So having a well-managed sleep will reduce the likelihood of you having a decrease in mental and physical performance. So understanding that sleep is a core center variable for all this is very important. Developing and implementing sleep intervention in the context of social, environmental, and structural constraints. As I said, a sleep specialist is not there to bulldoze or the entire schedule of an athlete. Well, in the name of sleep, you should be in bed at 10 and you should be up at this time and then manage your, your sports schedule. Now, <clears throat> the idea is to understand what is the social context of that athlete? What is the environmental context and what is the structural constraint? So take an a, e athlete that is also a student. First class is at eight in the morning. You're not gonna make him drop his class in the name of sleep. And a social context, he doesn't own a car, so he needs to be up a little bit more early to take the bus. So, all of these uh, contexts need to be uh, understood. And this is when I always talking about the flexibility of the intervention of sleep. It's not about sleeping at hour, it's about optimizing your schedule to the fullest, understanding all the constraints of the athletes. This is why sleep is such a individualized approach. Improving sleep and mental health among young adults in a known at risk group. Of course, the athletes are a at-risk group. You're a young adult, teenager, and the nature of your sport is being in front of a screen. Exactly what we're telling most of the people to avoid at night. But this goes to my second point. Esport is not going anywhere. It's just going to keep on growing and growing and growing. So knowing that, the sleep specialist needs to understand that the nature of the sport is not going to change you're always going to be in front of a screen. So how can we manage this? How can we develop this strategy among your among the, the population of the athletes to decrease the impact of the use of screen? Just taking, for example, whenever I'm talking with the athletes uh, through my uh, through uh, i5 or Zoom, I notice how uh, poor the quality my uh, computer chair is compared to, the, to them. <laughs> so just the structural of the chair is important for playing the gaming. Uh, can we use blue blocking glasses for uh, e athletes that will not impair or decrease their vision? Because if we're helping them sleeping better, but we are decreasing their ability to perform, we're not winning. At the end of the day, we really want to improve their sleep, but we also want to improve their performance. So knowing that the athletes are a, a, uh, at risk group, <clears throat> we also need to understand that the sleep specialist is not going to change the nature of the sport, with the sport which is a screen. We need to adapt to that new reality and make sure that we can optimize everything. Uh, generalizing from athletic organization to other groups. We want the athletes to reflect on the population the same way traditional athletes do. Meaning that I'm gonna take a very uh, obvious example, which is LeBron James. LeBron James is probably the idol of, I don't know how many thousand of kids. They will literally replicate everything he does. Hopefully it will always be in a positive uh, fashion. We want the uh, athletic organization in eSport to have the same impact on their subpopulation, meaning that there will be a next generation coming along that will grow up idolizing these e-athletes. Right? We want these e-athletes that are the idol to have a positive impact on the next generation. And this falls on the organization uh, desk. How can we make our sport a positive impact in our society? This is what I mean by generalizing from the athletic organization to other groups. At the end of the day, the athletes have a bigger responsibility than they ever realize, which is a influence on the next generation. And sleeping is part of it. Public health value of athletes as role model, as I just explained. <clears throat> you always want your athletes to replicate the value of your organization. 
Here's all the reference I use for the presentation. Thank you everyone for the attention. And if you have a question, I'm more than happy to answer them. All right. questioning what esports organizations can do as a whole to kind of change the structure and the culture of esports and promote just a better understanding of sleep. Yeah, no, it's a <clears throat> it's important, especially as a, a new uh, a new sport. It's not that new anymore, but it's still very uh, it's young days. I mean, growing with the understanding that these e athletes will have a major influence on the next generation is important for the organization. You want the organization to have the best positive influence on your on the next athletes to come. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I just asked like a personal question. So like when I was in my undergrad, I had a full case load or course load. I had to take the bus everywhere. I had really early classes and I found myself sacrificing lots of sleep. I did so many all-nighters. Um, what advice would you kind of give people in the similar situation as me now? Well, so that's a reality of a lot of, uh, of students. It's not everyone who own a car and especially even more in Calgary. I mean, it's so such a spread out city. So you're probably spending an hour or two in bus. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so basically it would be to bring a, uh, a sleep log. So with that sleep log, we have a 24 square, which represents a 24 hour in a day. And then we will draw the square of your obligation. So when are you in school? When are you in transit? And so on and so forth. And after that, we try to move these blocks. And don't forget that we are talking about sleeping weekly. So we want to gather as much sleep as possible on a weekly manner and not a daily manner. Because as I said, it's impossible to sleep an hour every night. You will always have at least one suboptimal night everyone everywhere across seven, ten days. But if you sleep well for for the majority of the time, so six nights out of seven for months and months, one poor night isn't going to change much. So making sure you see on a picture what are your obligations and then carving as much time as possible to sleep. And yes, avoiding at all costs these all nighters. Oh, neither. I'm not going to help you. <laughs> At the moment, I thought it would. <laughs> but yeah, on that same kind of uh, course, like during those times, I also thought about like sleep, sleeping pills or taking melatonin and things like that. Um, and then you mentioned like just now that you should only medicate when you after you see a sleep specialist. So I'm just wondering, like, are sleep medications similar to ca caffeine and such that they can be helpful if you schedule them properly <coughs> every day? And like, when would it be indicated? And is it used more as like a last resort? Well, so, so to begin with, so a lot of uh, teenagers we see, they, they come and see us and they are already on melatonin and, mm. on, ten, and <laughs> on, on, on 10 milligrams. First thing first, that's way too much should only use approximately one, maybe three milligram. Wow. And melatonin, as I said, it's not the sleep hormone, it's the darkness hormone, which means it's a time shifter. It's not a sleep inducer. So if you use melatonin in order to induce you into sleep, you're gonna swing and miss every time. Mm. So that's why I mean, this is through, this is through the education. As for the part of the question, when should we use medication? <clears throat> Is it as a last resort? I mean, every medication or drug should be as a last resort, in my opinion. However, mm -hmm. when medication is needed, it is needed. I mean, it's out there for a reason. And it is out there under a prescription for also a reason. So if you find yourself buying these over the counter uh, medication, sleepies, or whatever, it's a signal that you should be seeking the help of a sleep physician, explaining them, here's all my sleep problem. And the sleep physician will tell you very, very shortly, well, you need this, you only need behavioral uh, 
management or no. I think you need mitigation for a short amount of time just to change the narrative, reset you, and then we will lower your mitigation dosage up until we can hit zero. So this is how I would approach the mitigation part. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Do you ever have any issues of people ending up relying on it, kind of using it as like a crutch? Yeah, so they are crutches. So that's how I, I, I present them to my uh, my, my uh, patient is, if you need mitigation, it's because you actually require them. You don't question the crutches when you have a broken foot. I mean, now your sleep is broken and it's beyond broken. That will be a really, we may not be able to uh, bring it back. So let's use the mitigation with the help of an uh, MD, so a physician, so we can have a strategy with your mitigation. And is there a, a problem with some a reliance or addiction? Yes, we always have these, these patients and we have patients that will need mitigation uh, for a certain period of years. However, if the mitigation, as I said, is needed, it is needed, but we will try to bring it to its lower dose that we can possibly bring it down so we're not over mitigating anybody. That's always the goal of every physician. There's not a single physician out there that wants to over mitigate anyone. Is let's use the mitigation and after that, try to taper everyone off if we cannot at least use the lowest amount required. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It seems like there's a lot of things in sleep that have like false uh, conceptions about and then it's a very delicate topic, like when to use it and how to use it and things like that. It's like, so it's awesome. right. yeah. It's also it's a new subject. Right now. Yeah. And it, I guess it's, it's similar when it comes to like sleep trackers too, because I know like those apps and uh, like I own a Fitbit myself. And when I first got it, I was fascinated with this whole like, oh, I got eight hours. They give you a score like, oh, I have like a 7.4 this night. The next day I got it like a nine. Like I'm doing so good. Um, yeah. And so like when would it be appropriate to use like sleep trackers, like you mentioned that if you trust the athlete and kind of using it so that it's helpful and like as opposed to detrimental or adding on to like more anxiety, uh, then it can like lend like as a good tool to better uh, The only The only individual that should use sleep tracker is good sleeper. Mm, interesting, okay. A good, so I, let's say I have a, uh, an athlete in front of me, we have a very good sleeper, uh, no problem. He's just uh, in front of me for the purpose of education and making sure he cross all the T's dotted uh, all the I. And so we're just reassuring him and he's telling me, well, look, I'm having a uh, competition overseas and uh, I'd like to try my sleep. So based out of this, I know I have a very solid sleeper in front of me, then we'll track it. So here's your pattern, okay, you're always sleeping in that range. And then when he's overseas, we schedule appointments. So what is a tracker seeing? Tell me what you're feeling and now, okay, now we can strategize to bring you back to where you were in North America, but on the European soil. Mm -hmm. A poor sleeper on the other end, why, why is he a poor sleeper? Is it irregular scheduling? Is it insomnia? Is it sleep uh, breathing disorder? Is it movement disorder? Uh, is it just a uh, having poor sleep hygiene? I mean, the, the device is not going to capture that. Absolutely not. So I'm faced in front of a poor sleeper, which has a sleep score of four or three, but I don't know why. I don't know if it's if he's breathing or not even breathing at night. I just know he's not sleeping uh, adequately. Mm -hmm. So that's why we can use them with very good sleeper in order to strategize or travel. Uh, but with a poor sleeper, you're probably and most likely not going to go very far. Mm -hmm. that, makes, that does make a lot of sense. And Brad in the chat is saying like, yeah, if only Google could help us, there's too much misinformation everywhere. So like, which I think is a good point. Like I tend to go to Google first when I have questions. Uh, is there any like good resources or trusted sites or anything that you would kind of recommend for people like seeking more information on sleep? Sleeponit.com. Sleeponit.com. Yeah, sleeponit.com was uh, developed by the uh, University of Montreal, Dr. Julie Carrier. She's one of uh, the, uh, she's part of the Canadian Sleep Society. And uh, sleeponit.com is a very, very good resources uh, across Canada. 
to have information on sleep, any sleep issue, what sleep is, why currently we are more uh, experiencing more nightmare in the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, why people are dreaming more often during the pandemic. And so just because it's a hot topic. Uh, there is the insomnia, the sleep uh, breathing disorder. You have all of these information accessible for free on sleeponit.com. And the information you will find there is all uh, back and it's all supported by uh, sleep specialists, PhDs such as myself, and a physician in sleep. Awesome. Oh. So, <laughs> sleep on it. It is a mattress website. Yeah, it's sleeponitcanada.ca. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> I'm supposed okay. to make it. Just in case yeah. you guys need a new mattress too. Yeah, not at all. No, it's not a new mattress. I'm not going <laughs> to support any new mattress company. So it's sleeponitcanada.ca. It's awesome. If anyone has any questions in the chat, please plug it in and we'll be free to answer. But if not, we can also wrap up the stream. It's been awesome having you back again, Jonathan. Um, yeah, just having like a more formal presentation um, on things like highlighting issues that we see in our communities and how we can go forward. Super helpful. Like I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it's always a pleasure. I mean, I'm always happy to provide these kind of information and education to any group and especially the athletes. As I said, it's a very fast growing community and you, it is a at-risk group that deserve to be taken seriously. I mean, it's not basement players. That's not a stereotypical basement player. This is a, <laughs> this is a true sport that is very fastly growing. So they need and deserve the same uh, care as anyone, and they should be treated as athletes because they are athletes. So more than happy to always do it. It's always nice to have like industry experts really understand esports and like how big and important it is. Yeah, I know it's it, it, it is uh, it is crucial for the next generation. I think it's again, it's a fast. It, it's probably the most fast growing sport that we ever seen, and it's just keep it will just keep on growing, growing for the years to come. So definitely, it's going to be a huge, huge community in the very near future. Yeah. And maybe we'll just end this presentation with just like another quick plug to your research. So Jonathan is will be looking for research participants um, for his research that we mentioned earlier about uh, forming a valid and reliable tool on screening issues uh, in esports athletes. So look out for that and please join if you can. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll contact you. Don't worry about this. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us and we'll log off for now. Bye.